Thanks. Okay. No, really you can all see my screen? Also? Yes. Okay. Hi. So I hope you enjoyed the first uh, breakout group on uh, Open API. So my name is Christian Gendreau. I'm a technical advisor at uh, Agriculture and Agri-Food Canada, uh, mostly working on the DINA project to, to build an open source collection management system. So here, uh, we'll just go through a quick introduction to JSON API. Uh, so we had already a quick introduction to Open API. Here we'll do a quick introduction on JSON API, try again to uh, disambiguous what is responsible for what, and slowly walking through that uh, so that everybody's on the same page. Uh, so from the JSON API specification, the one sentence that defines more or less what it is, is that specification for our client should request that resource be fetched or modified, and now the server should respond to those requests. So then in relation to other words that we already encounter or that you may have uh, already heard, so there's the REST uh, principle or architectural principle that, meet, that stands for representation, representational state transfer, uh, that in one sentence, of course, everything is more complex and more subtle than that. But if I would need to uh, summarize that in one sentence, uh, would be like stateless API, web API over HTTP methods to access a resource. And already, uh, David already explained the difference between open API and what we call JSON API, uh, uh, just here in other words. So where the open API will describe the API. So regardless of the structure, any API, well, almost any API can be described by, uh, by open API. While JSON API is actually a format or a convention on the structure of the API, built on top of REST. So JSON API encompasses REST to access resource via, uh, via URL encoded parameters and the use of JSON to transmit data. So uh, I guess they're aware that JSON API is not probably not the best word <laughs> to describe what they're trying to do because, well, it's confusing because JSON API being like, uh, like a notation, uh, a lot of API over JSON are not JSON API, right? So that Get adds to the confusion, unfortunately. I was not responsible for naming that. <laughs> but uh, just so you know, JSON API is, a, like, is really a convention uh, and we'll have a, a quick look at that. So the HTTP method that, uh, that is mostly used uh, when we're building JSON uh, API uh, uh, web services are basically like David described, uh, get post, patch and delete. And we'll see why patch over put a little bit uh, further in the presentation. And just a typical get uh, that you would do uh, just slash and access a resource over HTTP would give you a specific resource. So just to note that the, the, the media type for JSON API is specific and cannot be changed. It's part of a uh, of the convention, uh, and this is what this application vnd.api plus JSON actually represent. Uh, so JSON API will always accept that, and that's basically how you would be able to distinguish an API over JSON versus a JSON API, the specific media type. So that's just to ensure that they're talking the same language, basically. Uh, it's defined by the spec, and you basically just need to add that to every request. You will get that in every responses. Uh, that's just the convention. You usually do that once, and then you can uh, you can move on. Uh, and uh, basically, the, the document structure uh, when you get something uh, on the JSON. Uh, uh, API web services is mostly defined like that. So that's what we could call like the envelope of every messages. So everything that you get or you post will have the data block and then you would have a type uh, identifier and an attribute section and a relationship section. So this, this kind of envelope, you'll see that uh, everywhere. It's always present. And you'll notice that the type is actually duplicated from the URL. So we'll see later why this is actually useful. Uh, the ID here, we're just using a numerical value, but it could be anything, of course. And the attribute section, which is the attribute of the main resource and the relationship of that resource. So that's the typical response that you will get, but it's also the same kind of envelope that you would use to interact uh, for all the other operation except delete maybe. Uh, so an attribute is a typical uh, 
like JSON notation where you would have the attribute that you want to set at the left and the value that you want to put inside at the right uh, for when you want to do to do alter something and the same thing when you get it. So you have the key and the value. That's simple as that for the attribute section. In the relationship section, uh, here you would get actually the name of the relationship here as let's say author and inside that you would get another data block of type people in the ID. It will usually just return you, here's the author of ID nine, but I don't know who exactly use that. I can only tell you that there's a relationship there. Same for comments. There's two comments, five and 12. I only telling you that there's comments. So if you play a little bit with APIs in the past, you quickly realize that, okay, that's cool. I can count them, but now I need what three other calls if I want to display all of that on the other on, on a single page. So again, JSON API uh, already had something to uh, to be able to to go around that to basically reduce the number of calls. And this is what they call like compound documents. So when you ask a resource, any resource on JSON API, you can specify what to include. So they will actually get the relationship and include that in an included block section. And this is why the standardization with the type that it's referred even if it's part of the URL becomes Indy because Andy, because what you get in the included section, actually, you know what it is because you still have the same pattern. You have type ID and attributes of the nested documents and so on. And you even have relationship of that nested document, right? So you can actually reduce the number of calls by saying, yeah, include uh similar like it's very similar to you saw the other talk on graphql things like that there's some similarity on on the, some of the features that you can do but here you can actually say yeah include those relationships because i will ask them anyway so send them in one single call so this is something that is defined uh, by the json api other some useful feature the other useful feature there's a, something that they call sparse field sets so like graphql you can say i'm only inter interested in those two specific fields only send that to me. All the other fields, I don't need to see them, so don't send that. Uh, so JSON API supports that. The update by patch, we'll see a real example. Of course, pagination sorting is all defined by, by the format. And they give an indication of how filtering could be done, but they don't really give a very good guidance on that. So it's still open. They say how you should communicate filtering, but they don't decide on any way to actually implement that. Uh, so it's still up to the developer and people to define how it should be done. So one of the interesting feature is really like the, the patch, how they actually define the patch. So uh, when you want to alter, let's say one attribute on a resource, they basically put in, this, in the spec that, well, if you only send one attribute in a patch, that's the only thing that should change. Server must not interpret missing attribute as null value. So uh, it really helps to not like carry giant payload up and down and then, okay, I'm all, I'm doing a put, here's everything. Because when you end up with big documents, it's a lot of operation to change just one single thing. So by implementing like that, you basically just alter one, the only thing that you want to change. Of course, there's, it's, put is still supported, but usually if you have like a, a user interface or script that only set single values, it's really handy to be able to just do that without transferring anything else about the document. And yeah, that was about it for the quick introduction to uh, to JSON API. And uh, I'm not sure if, if we're taking questions now or do we go to the... As far as I can see, um, there is only one question in the chat by mm -hmm. Ian, and mm -hmm. he's asking why not update by put, and I guess you already answered that. Yeah, you can update by put. It's just that if you only need to, to change one single thing, it's just more convenient to update that thing only and not the entire document. Uh, one other thing with uh, it's like when we end up with a lot of relationships, there's a lot of questions that needs to to be take taking into account, right? So if you send a put but not the relationship, does it mean that you want to get rid of the relationship or that they're just omitted? So that's why to do everything by patch makes it a little bit simpler by saying, okay, this is this is what I want to change. Just make sure this is changing the 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 rest of the document is untouched. 
I think it's a little bit express a little bit more uh, the intention, but put is still supported. You can actually put an entire document and, and it will work. But uh, but for us, we're usually working uh, using patch. There's a lot more to uh, <laughs> JSON API, of course. We've not their 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 specific uh, endpoint for relationships. Uh, how you how you can if you have a one to many, how can you remove a single one? So they have specific endpoints for relationship that you that you can have a look at. Uh, also, uh, uh, they, they have extensions that we also implemented in Dina calls like operation, where you can send. Let's say I want you you know that you need to get that. 10 documents, but by ID, there's a way to say, okay, I want like those 10 documents, but you can even send that to do gets on different things. So you, you can get like one article, two comments, three authors, send that in one request and get that. So that's the kind of thing it supports. But yeah, in 10 minutes, I was a little bit limited <laughs> in what we can do. And I don't want to overwhelm people. The spec is not super heavy to read. And I would say it's quite clear. It's not perfect, of course. But uh, yeah, I encourage you to have a quick look at the spec if you have an interest in it. There... Yeah. Okay, so thanks. If, 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 if I may, we're, we're a little bit behind schedule. Um, and um, I wonder if we could still manage to meet back after our breakout sessions at 10 past the hour. So 1510 UTC. So that gives us a little bit less time for this next breakout session, but we need to have time at the end to have a bit more of an open session and uh, concluding remarks. So um, let's go into the breakout sessions again, as we did before, um, but make sure that we can um, meet back again at uh, 10 past the hour. No worries. I'll go ahead and break it out now. Right, super. Um, are you okay with it being the same people in the same breakout rooms? Yeah. Yeah, sure. Okay. No worries. And Falco, if you want to um, just give me a heads up when you want me to send that message again. Okay, great. Yeah, I think that the slide is helpful for sure, <laughs> in case people come in here. Okay, thanks. Yeah.
Falco, do you want me to send the um the five minute message in just a second? That would be great. Yeah. Okay, great. Because it's at the, the 10 minute hour, right? After 10. Exactly. Okay. Thanks. I'll go ahead and um, close them in just a moment and they'll have a minute to come back. Thanks.
I had a, so the question that I had in my uh, breakout session, I can answer it just after. Uh... <laughs> perfect, perfect. Yeah, sorry. It's not been... Yeah, it just closed on me too. Paco, how's your breakout room? Ours was pretty good. I was in the main room, so. Um... Oh, okay, okay. So you didn't see it. Yeah, no worries. We definitely will hear from David. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but welcome back, everyone. Um, I hope you enjoyed the breakout session, even though it was a little bit uh, shorter than expected. But we have the remaining um, 20 minutes for an open discussion on, um, on benefits and limitations um, and general questions. Um, and then we would also reserve um, at least yeah, five to 10 minutes at the very end for some closing words. Uh, Christian, do you wanna, do you wanna attempt to answer your question here now since we're kind of an open discussion mode? Yeah, sure. I would need to, uh... Salpal, can you repeat the question please? Or if it's in the chat, I can probably find it, but I think it disappeared. Yeah, I missed the question. I just heard that. No, it's, it's the chat message from Ian. Just scroll up a bit. It should be in the chat. Um, I can repeat it if it's difficult to find it. Um, it was just um, uh, about the schema mm -hmm. um, that you guys are that you guys have built for Dina, and um, and so. Uh, so I'm a specify fan. I'll just uh, put that out there to start with, mm -hmm. and um, and so and I think specify has got a really a really excellent schema. I think there's there's a couple of uh, shortcomings, but um, but overall it's really excellent. And um, and I saw that some of the fields that we have for for a person in specify haven't made it into your schema, and um, and so I tried to post a record and it didn't go in uh, mm -hmm. with one of those fields, and then. And then the question is also with specify, we can, um, you know, they've got, they're not custom fields, but they're like an, a set of fields in the, in a database table that you can then customize to your purpose. So they're not like true fields that you're adding onto the schema, um, but that sort of extensibility of the schema seems quite important. Yeah, so uh, we have that. In Dina it is called uh, manage attributes. So you may see that in the, uh, in the collecting event page, you'll see at some point there, uh, somewhere in the page, there's something called manage attributes. So this is where you would define uh, an attribute and its type, and then it allows you to use that uh, on the, what is called the component that you actually, uh, that you actually target. So that allows you to add unlimited number of custom fields on any pieces in the software that you may like. Uh, that's currently just on, the collecting objects it's not on agent uh just because we there's no need that was expressed regarding that uh so uh, it's not there but uh yeah it's definitely possible to to have that everywhere uh that's not really a, a limitation it's just that it was not done because it was not required uh it also has some implication on on how data is shared so that's also why we try to reach a balance because the user really like to use custom fields everywhere. The problem is that it's sometimes it will play against inter interoperability and ability to share data using a standard because people will say, okay, I want to record here my, uh, I don't know, uh, depth in meters and depth in feet and or depth in whatever you need that will put. And then you try to share that and there's no consensus on how this should be done. So uh, the door is definitely open, but it's kind of limited by design to make sure we can actually share as much as we can. Uh, but there is the ability to do that. So that was not a short response, but <laughs> I hope it helps. No, no, thanks. Any more uh, questions? I have or a feedback? question. Um, this is more Just for the ahead. like the people who would actually use um, this software. 
um, like I'm a software developer, so I have to think about the end users. Um, I know for when you talk to like biology um, researchers, they know R. So if they need to, and they're not good at, you know, um, pro general programming. So if they want to interface with the API, there would be an R package that will um, handle connecting to the API and all this stuff. But I'm wondering for like collection managers, would you use an API directly or would you use a, a, would you prefer like a package that hides away some of the API stuff so you can just connect using a specific language or would you actually use the web interface? I can partially answer that. I've just pasted something into the chat where there are R package wrappers that would, uh, you know, in essence, create a client that would allow access to those open API endpoints. Uh, whether or not they behave well when it comes time to actually managing and dealing with properly the response that is the JSON API component of it, I do not know. I've not yet explored that particular R package to know. Um, but at least that's one of the advantage of, advantages of having something like an open API and a well-specified um, schema um, with hopefully with that JSON API component accommodated within those R packages, then that is possible um, as opposed to writing a bespoke API um, where the maintenance of those kind of R packages as wrappers becomes a lot more brittle. And I would like to, to add, um... I was not joining any of the breakout groups, but I'm pretty sure Christian and David, you mentioned the, the Dina user interface. Of course, this is using uh, the, the Dina API. So um, I just want to avoid that there is a confusion uh, between the end users of the Dina system, um, like the collection managers, uh, the, the collection stuff, um, and those who would like to interact with the API a little bit more, like you just mentioned with the R package and other scripts. And, and what I mentioned yeah. in our breakout session as well is that part of my duties is to migrate data from all the silos within our institution to put it into Dina. And what am I going to use? The API. And so, the, you know, in terms of internally, yet another use case and end user is those responsible for pumping data from all the various sources in, into the system where I would interact with it as a data migrator in precisely the same way as should we have opened up any of those endpoints to the public. And if I could just put my perspective, uh, so, uh, during the project phase, you know, we're really kind of focused on, you know, uh, finishing the web interface. The API is kind of secondary for our collection managers who aren't really programmers per se, right? Um, in the future, I think we definitely want to template out, you know, whatever language you're using, we could have, you know, uh, some templates for connecting over the API. Maybe we can maintain those for the project. But I think, you know, the normal use cases for our institution is that collection managers would typically use the web interface. If they got you know, uh, a big project, they might get money for a student or another kind of resource who would be able to program against the API. And so they would typically get you know, additional staff to do that work, uh, not hands-on directly. Um, but yeah, we do have other use cases like David who yeah, typically would just use the API for his work. Um, so, so yeah, we're trying to balance these levels and during the project phase, it's kind of all about priorities. I think that is gonna be a future uh, thing for sure. Ian's got his hand up. Yeah, I can maybe just um, speak from my own experience uh, recently with, uh, with using one of these clients. So it was a Python client for an API. And to be honest, I mean, I think it would have been easier just to go straight to the API. I think for, for users who are kind of, you know, using one particular system, um, I can't remember earlier, there was a talk in the conference where users are using a particular R package for working with a particular system and regularly downloading, downloading data through it. And if that's what they're doing, you know, that's their kind of main go-to resource and that's the only API that they're working with Then the packages are nice. But, um, 
but if you're working with a bunch of APIs and you've got to kind of work your way around how each package works with that API, um, it does get a bit much. That's the same experience I had in playing around with making a Ruby-based client uh, from the, that open API utility. You know, you can make a client for Ruby, you can make a client for Java, you can make a client for Python, another one for PHP. And what emerged from that in Ruby was largely incomprehensible <laughs> and very generic and not particularly friendly. And missing from it was the whole authentication part, um, which was rather perplexing. Um, and you know, having to figure out what a token is and then make use of it in that, and that uh, what emerged from that code was a, a bit of a nuisance. And you're right. I think in many cases, it may be more efficient just to write your own as opposed to making use of those clients. Um, if I may, th there were some comments in our session that I think are worth uh, bubbling up here. Uh, when we were toying around with the uh, open API interface and we managed to make some records and we managed to make a join between records an organization joined to a person and that worked relatively well. Um, when, it comes, when it came time to actually looking at a, a collecting event object and figuring out how to post that, unlike something like the um, iNaturalist open API endpoint where all the parameters are specified here, the design decision of making use of something like JSON API that obligates you to make this really well structured document to post that in there becomes a bit of a pain when you're looking at it via the open API interface. You don't know what part of the JSON object is can be changed and what can't be. Um, and when you then try and submit that, the error responses that come back are to a degree somewhat informative, but many times not. And there's a lot of confusion in figuring out you know, so I think there's a lot of work that could be done on that open API interface to accommodate other structured documents that need to be posted, not just parameters. So I think um, if there are no further yep. urgent questions or comments. Falco, I just want to add one from an even broader than Dina perspective uh, to uh, weigh in's question. And I put it in mm -hmm. the chat, but I'm just saying from working with the Carpentries community and working with the collections community, some are quite savvy. Some are quite, uh, others will. So again, this will we need one way or will we need the other? And, it, and it's not only the interfaces, but the multiple ways to access the information for sure. If I can, if I can jump on the, um the issues with when you get back errors, treating errors is almost a task unto itself. It's almost a separate response about how you technically handle errors and what kind of messages you provide that it's, it's really requires extra attention to really characterize that response. Cause it, the basic status codes, 200, 400, it doesn't tell you a whole lot. And not only that, but if you do them right and really implement all of them, you still need to include a message more specific to the actual API about what went wrong. Otherwise it's just kind of like, well, I guess it was there, you know, I mean, but it could be just you forgot a parameter, it could be a lot of different things and it really matters. Yeah, thanks. I, I also think that's an, uh, um, a really valid and important point. So uh, if there are no urgent questions um, at this point or feedback, I would like to invite you to continue the discussion um, by reaching out uh, to either the Dina team or get involved uh, in um, in the interest groups that would also uh, be uh, coping with such topics, not only with Dina, but with APIs and things like Ben just mentioned, error handling and um, standards about um, APIs. Um, for the closing words, I would now like to um, leave the floor for James and um, yeah thanks go ahead James thanks Falco just going to share my screen here quick going to present does that look good looks good yes okay so uh, what is Dina or sort of in, in the bigger picture what is the consortium and, and why 
why did we decide to do something new and, and what's behind it? Um, well, in a, in a nutshell, uh, you know, the consortium is about digital information systems and services. And, and as you can see, it's really driven by a service model, getting away from the sort of monolithic approach that, that uh, many other systems, you know, for better or for worse, have, have decided to do, mostly historically. So, you know, we're trying to provide museum staff with efficient tools to, and, and I would say researchers as well to handle um, digitization of collections and enable research communities to work with the collections that we have in, in, in a more effective way. And so the goal is really to produce this open source web-based software environment for the management of these collections uh, in, a, in a community driven approach. Uh, where, yes, several large institutions will likely underpin its, its sort of development and sustainability, but then it becomes, it, it's, it's an open resource for everyone. And so at the moment, you know, we, we have a concept of core members and associate members. Everybody is sort of invested in the shared vision, the expertise, the interest, they're all there for that reason, these, this sort of common belief in, in what we're trying to do. But the core members, uh, which at the moment is, is mostly Agriculture and Agri-Food Canada, so where I am, and uh, uh, Museum for Natural Kunde in, in, in Berlin. We're, we're the two drivers, but we have lots of, of help on the side. Uh, and, you know, we're, we're trying to use this model and expand our community. So what we're really trying to do is look at that other community that's sitting beside us, the same challenges that we all, you know, have, uh, and think of this as pieces of the puzzle. So instead of saying you must use just this software or this software, we're saying we have some services that are available. When you add them together, they make a, they make a core. Uh, you may or may not want some of those services. And in our case, that doesn't matter. You don't have to take that burden with you. But we also are interested in using other services and to make that really easy for us to do. And so we really want that communication whether it's directly associated with the DINA consortium or in partnership with the community itself. And so we're really trying to expand ourselves, of course, to having more associate members, more people contributing to say, hey, you know, these mod modules would be valuable or this kind of service would be great. And of course, we want to expand the core at the same time. And we understand that there's a lot of non-domain specific pieces of services that we want to use on the outside and, and want to continue to do that. So if you're interested in the project and you want to learn more, we are, all of our documentation is open. So if you go to the uh, URL that's uh, below there, uh, and hopefully someone can paste that in the chat, you know, all of our meetings, all the discussions, all of our planning over the last well, more than five, five to 10 years, uh, it's all there. Uh, and and you, can, you can read to your, uh, <laughs> to your interest. But for some people, of course, you'll want to come straight to uh, our open code and the technical documentation, which is of course stored, stored in our uh, GitHub presence, which you can see the uh, link to down below. So Dina is really envisaged, envisaged as a sustainable software ecosystem. In other words, there's lots of services, components to it that can be added on or removed depending on what your institution really needs. And so, it's important that it can evolve and adapt to these new challenges, new technologies and requirements without sort of getting stuck. And as a final reminder, we wanted to say, don't forget that uh, we're only halfway through our API types of talks. Uh, there's the API unconference tomorrow in two sessions. And so if you liked what you saw here and you're still uh, curious, there's gonna be a much broader uh, discussion tomorrow, uh, which, which the the people who are there will somewhat control. Uh, so I think that's gonna be a lot of fun. And as, uh, as a, in a wider perspective in the, in the Tadwick frame, we have a uh, interest group in biodiversity services and clients that is where the discussions at the level we've talked about, should we standardize services? We've talked about, should we have sort of some kind of, uh, what's the right word, not trust, but, but a, some kind of seal that says these services are reliable in this way, or these services are documented to produce these endpoints. Um, so this is where that discussion happens. And in November, uh, you can see there, there's a chance for anybody who's interested to join and influence uh, how, how we work. So 
In closing, just like to thank everybody for attending. I, I hope everybody's come away with a little more knowledge about APIs. Uh, and we'd like to see you reveal your APIs and, and join forces with us today. And so thank you very much to everyone. Great, thanks so much, James. Thanks, James. Thanks to all the audience and to all the speakers. And see you in the unconference session, hopefully, uh, continue.